And um, what I'm going to tell you about is the science that we've been doing for almost a decade, trying to understand how the delta used to work historically, how it works now, and how it could work better in the future to do the kinds of things that we would like it to do, like supporting native wildlife, having a robust food web, things like that. And I wanted to remind you that in 2012, so about four years ago, my colleagues who wrote the historical ecology report came and presented to you about it. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna glide over that very quickly. In the interim in 2014, if you look at that middle map, we looked at how the delta works now, and we tried to understand the transformation of that historical landscape on the left to the current landscape in the middle. So I'll be telling you a little bit about that report because the fundamental transformation of the delta, it really informs what we can do in the future to transform it again. And that's the report that we're coming out with in about a month. It's called A Delta Renewed, and that uh, Jessica referred to. So if you can't read the words, don't worry about it. What, what these are are quotes for, from some really important documents backing up the foundation of how we approached this science, and that was to look at very large-scale, holistic, long-term, system-based restoration of the delta. So this is not a plan for restoring one species or one place. This is a plan for restoring the entire system. And that's, uh, in some ways, that's very different than a lot of what's required um, in the past in a regulatory way. So there ha that science isn't out there yet. And that's why the department hired us to try to come up with this approach. And we were able to do it somewhat independently um, without a lot of political pressure. And I think that's one of the strengths of our series of reports. So a quick reminder about what this place used to look like in the delta. It was basically one big wetland with several rivers flowing through it. It was really actually a lot of deltas that poured into one place. And here's that same view of the Sacramento River now. So just a really quick overview that we have radically transformed this place almost 100%. The way that we've approached this work has always been to be to have this sort of all-star team of scientists reviewing and um, giving input on our work. So we feel that we've been able to have the most up-to-date and best available science because we're drawing on a lot of local and national expertise. And we call them our landscape interpretation team since all of our work was based on landscape science. And so to get at this holistic, long-time view, large spatial scale approach, the first thing we said to ourselves is what do people want the Delta to do ecologically that it's not doing now? And so we came up with what we call ecological functions, and that's the band in yellow. And those are um, eight things. Five of them are about supporting different groups of wildlife. We want the de Delta to support native fish. We want the Delta to support marsh wildlife. We want the Delta to support riparian wildlife that lives along streams. But then we went beyond that sort of taxonomic approach and said we also want to have a robust food web. We want the whole system to work. We want our populations to be able to evolve with natural selection or no matter how big their habitats are, they're not going to be able to face climate change. So we took a sort of deep um, technical ecological approach to structure the work and then we made a lot of measurements of how the landscape changed that would affect these desired functions. That's what all the pink boxes are. And You'll see as I go through what I mean in more detail. So here again, we're looking at that change from historical to modern. These are two different habitat maps. And you can see just by looking at the colors, that change from blue to pink, which is also emphasized in the bar graph, um, what's happened. And I explained this to my four-year-old a year ago. And he said, oh, I get it, mommy. We've taken food for wildlife and turned it into food for people. And that's exactly what happened. There was a big wetland here. It fed wildlife. And now we've got a big, really productive agricultural area. And so at the most basic level, that's been the transformation. But there's a lot of complexity to it that I want to tell you guys a little bit more about. So one of the really big process-based changes, and I'm going to talk a lot about processes because processes are what underlie the system and make it work. And when I say that, I mean things like flows, flooding, delivery of sediment, those big physical processes on the land surface that create and maintain ecosystems and habitats. And so here you're looking at a map of different kinds of flooding that happened in the historical delta. That dark purpley blue in the north and south is basin flooding. It's long term, several months, several feet deep. These were basically massively productive flood plains. They were there for several months of the year. They actually occurred at different times in the north and south, and they fed fish, they fed bears, they fed everything that could come in, birds, everything that could come and take advantage of it. In the middle, that medium blue is all the tidal flooding. So that was flooding almost every day. And so that was a place where there were productive wetlands year round. 
And then around the periphery, you see a light blue. And those were seasonally flooded, kind of intermittent wetlands, wet meadows, flooding off and on in a complicated pattern. And you'll notice that that really dark blue of the channels, there's not that much of it. There wasn't that much water, perennial water, all the time in the delta. And it was mostly moving. There weren't a lot of lakes. So historically, what you can see is a really complex pattern, different kinds of flooding, different places, different times of year. And that was the refrigerator of California. That made food. And so all the wildlife that could get here would come here to eat. And when they did, they had different options. So if it was a hot year or a dry year or a cool year or it was April or it was September, there was somewhere to go. And there would always be food in the delta and, and cover. Here's what our inundation map looks like now. There's actually more of that very dark blue perennial lake-like water. So those are kind of novel places that our species weren't adapted to. There's none of that deep basin flooding, essentially. There's almost no tidal flooding. We know there's a couple marshes, about 1% to 2% of what there used to be. And then there's a little bit of that light blue sort of short-term seasonal flooding. You see a lot of it in the Yolo Bypass in the north. And there's a little bit in the Cosumnes. OK, thanks. So there's a little bit on the Cosumnes River, if you know where that is. And those are actually our two really great examples of success. So where we've made these floodplains, even they though they somewhat pale in comparison to the historical function that used to be there, they're working, right? The Yolo Bypass is a success. The Cosumnes River restoration is a success. So just to say that even though we've radically transformed the system, even when we transform small pieces of it back, we see a lot of response. And we know that a fish that grow on the floodplain become very fat. They're called floodplain fatties. And then our channel fish tend to be relatively small. And so I decided to call them river runts. I was trying to come up with some <laughs> alliteration for you. OK, well, quickly looking at marshes, because we already talked about this. If you look, about, look at the change in green, that's the 98% loss of tidal marsh, uh, about 99% loss if you include all the different kinds of marsh. So no surprise that things are hard here for species that evolved to live in a totally different place than what we have now. Now let's think a little bit more carefully about what's happened to the channels, because this is kind of complicated. You still see a lot of channels in the delta, but they're not the same as what was here historically. So you can see that these are very dendritic networks. They're a lot like the blood system in your body. So there were all these big channels, kind of like arteries, that went into little channels like capillaries. And these fed the marsh and took away waste products, just like the capillaries do in your body. Here's the channels now. So see the gray is now. And what you can realize is that almost all the capillaries are gone. And so by taking out the wetlands, we've kind of starved the landscape of that exchange of materials and energy and biota that made the system work. In addition, we've added a lot of cross-channel cuts. And those have allowed the water to move faster and in different directions. And if you can imagine that someone did this to your circulatory system, you wouldn't be feeling very well either. So I, I hope these analogies help us to kind of understand in a really basic way the transformation that's occurred. As we were producing that report on delta transformation, we were also really coming up with how do we think scientifically about resilience of a landscape? We've got climate change. We've got pressure on water supply. We've got growing human population size. We went to the entire world literature and said, what are the things that we can do to make landscapes resilient? And we were lucky enough to produce this report, which is now becoming a peer-reviewed manuscript, with some of the experts on resilient science from around the world. So. Um, this is really a coalescing of some pretty esoteric ecology literature. And the idea was to make it operational for people who are actually doing restoration. And so we came up with these principles. I'm happy to share this with you. It's a short, quick read about what you should do on the ground to make a whole landscape work better um, in the face of perturbations and long-term change like sea level rise. And so there are principles like think about the setting, restore your fundamental physical processes, make sure you have the appropriate levels of connectivity, shoot for diversity and complexity, um, you need redundancy, which is kind of interesting, so you need to hedge your bets if you lose a population or a patch, make sure you're operating at the right scale, often a huge challenge for us in restoration to do things big enough and long-term enough, and then remember that people are, are the critical key here, both for, make, both for making decisions and in the Delta, people live here. And there are many ecosystem services this landscape has to continue to provide. So that led us to this really basic conceptual model that I want to share with you about how we think about landscape resilience. So are these physical processes that I just talked about, like flooding and flows and sediment supply, and those create and maintain a landscape. And the interaction of those processes with the landscape determines what you get out in terms of ecological functions. And these are things like supporting native wildlife, 
a robust food web. They can include other ecosystem services like water supply, water quality. This is basically how our ecosystems work. And this, let's pretend this is the historical ecosystem. It was pretty intact. Everything used to work. And then we decided to make some changes. And so we interrupted a lot of the physical processes of flooding and flows and sediment delivery. We took away a lot of the elements of the landscape of the natural system and fragmented. We added some new elements. And now we're not getting out all of those historical ecological functions, which is creating, which is what we're trying to restore. So how can we deal with this? And our approach is to put back some of the physical processes strategically. It's not a return to historical conditions. It's a scientific approach to thinking at the landscape scale, what do we need where? Then we need to restore some landscape elements. We need bigger habitat patches. They need to be connected. All those principles I was saying from our landscape resilience framework. And if you do that, you're going to get back ecological function. It's not going to be like historical function, but you can get back all the things you need to maintain the species or functions you're interested in. So that's the idea. Here's a quick look at the report that's coming out. So we have our functions that I showed you in that graph with the yellow boxes and the pink boxes. And this one, for example, is how do you support marsh wildlife? And we give you this conceptual map. We're, we're very carefully not saying do this on this parcel. <laughs> but we are saying make these kinds of habitats and processes come back in these kinds and parts of the delta. Here's kind of the configuration and the scale and the size of what you should be thinking about doing. Here's what should be next to other things. And we've kind of overemphasized the extent of restoration here just so you can see all the little bits on the map. And then we know that to, if you're going to look at, uh, if you're going to actually design a project, you need a smaller scale idea of what to do. So let's say you're interested in returning marsh wildlife to part of the delta. Well, how would you actually do it at a sm in a real place? And so then we have these conceptual maps of different strategies that you would bring together in an integrated way to restore that wet marsh wildlife function in one place. So for example, these are all. Well, I guess I should say these are all based on returning those physical processes that we talked about. So they are things like reestablish um, tidal processes at the right elevations, reestablish fluvial processes at the fluvial tidal interface. So they're kind of technical ideas, and here we try to make them very clear about how you would piece it together, wildlife-friendly agriculture, subsidence reversal. It's those kind of strategies. And we have maps like this for each of our functions. And then we have a lot of detail about those strategies so that project designers and managers can really get into all of the data that we looked at to think about what they want to do where. For example, this is uh, the strategy of restoring tidal processes at intertidal elevations. And so this map, look, it, all the colors of green are about where the appropriate elevations are to restore tidal marsh, looking both at what's intertidal now, and what will be intertidal with up to two meters of sea level rise. So this is all looking forward for long time scales. And you can see that we call out on that map different parts of the delta and try to say, like, well, here's a place with a lot of public land. Maybe this, you know, and it has the right elevation. So this is a good place to be thinking about doing this kind of thing. And this is repeated for nine different strategies. And then we know that people who design projects want numbers. Well, how big should it be? How far, far apart? What shape should it be? And as scientists, we can't tell you how many fish you want or how many tidal marsh birds you want. That's a societal choice. But we can tell you, if you make things a certain size, what are you likely to get? And so that's what we try to do in this section with the targets. So the recommendation here is marshes should be as large as possible if you want to get back marsh wildlife. That's pretty clear. But then what does that mean? How big is big? And so we look at, OK, well, if you make a two hectare marsh, you might get a black rail. It's a cute little black marsh bird. If you have a 100 hectare marsh, you might get a really good, dense population of black rails. So now you're starting to see more function coming out of that patch. If you have a 500 acre marsh, then it's big enough to restore the tidal processes that create those dendritic networks that are like arteries that we talked about. So there you're starting to get a systems approach. OK. If I make a marsh that big, I can set up a system that's going to be self-sustaining and work on its own. Now, is that like restoring to historical? No, because the historical average patch size was nine times bigger, 4,500 square or 4,500 hectares, and the largest marsh patch size historically was 110,000 hectares. So we're not talking about restoring to historical. We're trying to give guidelines to get that function back. I just want to make that clear because people are always confused about that. So in conclusion, I just want to remind us that here we are in this beautiful place that has incredible ecosystem services and values because it was a wetland, and wetlands give us so much of that. 
We've been making good use of it for different things for people and trying to conserve it for wildlife as well. And there is a future option. If we think big, we're willing to work on line, large time scales and think about the full system and not just one species at a time, where we can integrate the functions we want back from this landscape in a working landscape that gives us water, that gives us agriculture, um, that gives us a special place for the people who live here to still feel like they're living in the Delta. And I want to thank all of our funders and the scientists that worked on this project. <laughs>